my name is Deloria Johnson. Oh, <laughs> hello, and I'm Nick Cope. And we will be talking about outgrowing Terraform. Um, I am a software engineer at Guidewire, and I work on um, cloud infrastructure, specifically in persistence type resources. Um, Guidewire is a platform as a service company um, that caters to the property and casualty insurance industry. And we're currently beginning our migration into crossplay. So speaking of crossplane, uh, again, I'm Nick. I'm a, I'm a software architect, uh, software engineer, uh, working at Upbound on crossplane. I'm on the uh, crossplane steering committee, and I've been working on crossplane since shortly enough after it was open source, since the founders open source got about two years ago. Uh, before working on crossplane, I did a lot of work with Terraform, so I'm a big fan of both. OK, so Guidewire. But prior to becoming a platform as a service company, we provided on-premise solutions to our customers. Our development process used to involve developing complex software installations at our customers' offices. So the cost and effort of doing so, um, of installing these Snowflake on-site um, installations is not very cost-effective. It doesn't scale very well. And it takes a long time to upgrade because the installation will take a two year, it's a two year process to get, you know, any new features in there. So um, we decided to make a shift towards the cloud. So given Guideware's long extensive history in property and casualty, we were set in a better position to try to unify, um, try to put our current customers on a platform where the ecosystem can better serve our customers. But um, to that point, um, we used Terraform to build our platform. Um, it was, it aided us in our shift by being, you know, basically kind of, you know, just a good intermediate step into managing cloud resources. Um, the, the implementation itself is similar to JSON, which a lot of developers are already used to. And so we were able to leverage that type of um, language to manage AWS resources. But um, as time went by, our platform is, you know, growing and getting large. And now we're maintaining, you know, about 73,000 lines of HCL. So now we're starting to, um, we're starting to, to fill some of the limitations of Terraform. We've, uh, we really used the heck out of it. <laughs> So one limitation that we've um, come to encounter um, is that um, one thing I did uh, forgot to uh, mention was the fact that our infrastructure is basically consisting of three layers. We have our account level configuration, which is one module. We have our infrastructure mod, uh, layer, which is a, another module that um, is built on the, the resources that the account level module provisions. And then we have our more customer facing module, our tenant module that uses those, those two previous layers to um, provision resources that the user did our customers can use to develop and uh, customize our products. So having said that, uh, one limita limitation is drift. So um, Terraform defines our resources uh, in a, you know, pretty much in a file, a, you know, you have one, your Terraform file and you have your Terraform state. So, um, and they're stored either, well, the Terraform state is stored in a remote um, bucket and the Terraform um, source of truth, what defines our actual, what defines what resources we need for a given module is stored in Git. So unfortunately, there's no way for these two pieces of information to be constantly and up to date with what is you know, actually out there. So unfortunately, there, things happen like auto minor, up, auto minor version upgrades or somebody mistakenly goes in and into the console, into the actual um, provider console and changes something, there's no way for Terraform to know until 
you know, somebody comes along and tries to introduce another change. So you have to actively go in and manage and make sure and be aware when you introduce a change, you have to be aware of the plan. And as we mentioned earlier, our whole infrastructure is based on three Terraform modules that consist of hundreds of resources and several modules. So let's say you wanna change a tag on one resource. If you were to do a Terraform plan or an apply, you have to be, you have to take into account that there might be drift and your plan, you have to make sure that your plan is not um, either, it's not basically worst case destroying another resource that you don't mean to do. So if uh, your plan says, hey, this resource is gonna be destroyed or replaced because somehow this one you know, um, field, can, it has an update to something that will, that will basically, you know, it will force Terraform to, to destroy and replace it because it doesn't match the state. So anyways. So cross-plane approaches uh, Managing infrastructure similarly to Terraform in that they both use uh, declarative configuration. Um, but a big difference that Crossplane has is that it is a always on control plane. So whereas the open source uh, version of Terraform at least is a, uh, is a command line tool that's uh, invoked on demand. I know Guidewire uh, uses it uh, via CICD a lot, um, but you know, you can always, you can also invoke it from developer laptops. And uh, like DeLorean was saying, part of the problem is Terraform doesn't know to go check the world unless you ask it to uh, whether something has changed. So this can lead to surprises. You know, you go and run Terraform to go and update your caches and it's actually saying, yeah, I'm going to update your caches, but also I notice your databases need updating as well and, and you weren't expecting that. Crossplane kind of um, approaches this uh, by, by leaning in to, to constant reconciliation. So instead of uh, checking the world whenever someone tells Crossplane, hey, um, you know, I, I want to change something. There's sort of two levels with Crossplane. First, you tell you Crossplane, I want to change something. The Crossplane saves that as its desired state, and then it just sits there forever applying that desired state. So you need to be a little bit brave because it takes away the kind of the check that you get with Terraform, where Terraform's like, hey, I'm going to go change this. Here's what I would change. Is this okay? Crossplane, you say, hey, go change this, and then Crossplane will just always be running every 30 to 60 seconds, correcting uh, any any problems it finds in the world. So if, uh, for example, someone goes into your AWS console and um, uh, changes a database from 20 gig to 30 gig of storage, Crossplane will just change it back to 20 gig if that's what the, uh, the source of truth is, or if you've trusted Crossplane to manage that infrastructure. So it kind of forces you to uh, buy into to Crossplane. You, you can't really fight Crossplane. Um, a nice thing about Crossplane as well is that it doesn't have this big graph of um, of the world that the terraform computes to do sort of audit applications and things like that because crossplane is always running it can be a little bit less tightly coupled it can be eventually consistent so this means if you say hey crossplane go update this database a it is possible to just update that database regardless of what your caches are doing you just be like just update this one thing don't touch the others um b uh if multiple things do need to change they can all just kind of change when they're ready sort of thing. So Crossplane can effectively go and apply changes to your database. And if that change is blocked or a change to your cache or something like that, um, when your cache is ready, Crossplane just becomes ready. Another um, limitation that we have experienced is versioning. So again, I'm going back to that to the, to the beginning, our whole infrastructure revolves around basically three Terraform modules. So within those different modules, um, there are hundreds of resources, again, several modules, and they pretty much all have to be within the same range of the Terraform version and um, AWS provider version. In our case, I guess the you know, AWS provider version. Um, so, if, uh, again, if one layer needs to basically be applied, they all, every resource, every module, which is controlled by different teams, um, especially in the tenant um, level, they, you know, we have to, they all have to basically be on the same version. So there was actually a case recently 
where my team wanted to introduce a new Terraform feature. It was um, between, uh, it was a new feature in Terraform 13, or 0.13 would allow a count on um, Terraform modules. So because we're part of a single module from the perspective of our platform, in order to introduce that module, we had to basically go through every module, talk to pretty much every team that manages any resource and change their repo to get this one change out there for, for us. So that was, that was an experience. I mean, the, the bright side is we got to talk to a lot of people, but the downside is it took a month to introduce this to our platform. So like, like Terraform, Crossplane uses providers. We have a core of Crossplane that um, effectively has a package manager that delivers providers that manages what providers are installed, as well as um, managing configuration for providers. So the, you know, the, de the, the declarative configuration of what you want to be running uh, in the world. Um, so providers are versioned in crossplane as well, and honestly, you can hit um, some some problems with uh, with versioning. You do need to be careful. You you could say, for instance, some um, providers can declare what version of uh, crossplane they're compatible with, and it could be that you hit you want to install a new version of provider SQL to manage your SQL databases, but um, that needs a particular crossplane version, and uh, you've got provider AWS that needs a different incompatible version. So it's possible to have version inconsistency in crossplane too or incompatibilities. But one thing that um, makes the problem a lot simpler in Crossplane is that because it is a service, because it's a control plane that's just off running somewhere that doesn't you know, need to have providers installed on different people's laptops and different providers configured for different you know, uh, modules of, of, uh, uh, of Terraform code in, in that example, uh, you have a centralized place that you can go and upgrade your Terraform, sorry, your uh, Crossplane providers. So you could just go to the cross plane and control plane and say, okay, I'd like to install provide AWS. And as long as it doesn't make breaking API changes, everyone is now just running the new version of provider AWS. So it sort of takes um, takes the problem of like what version of software is running and where and boils it down to like, does a new version make breaking API changes? And cross plane uh, takes pretty seriously following the Kubernetes strict versioning policies. Uh, so, in Kubernetes resource versions, everything V1 beta one or above has a pretty strict no breaking changes policy. So theoretically in DeLorean's case where one team wanted a, uh, a new feature, uh, you should be able to upgrade to the new version of Crossplane uh, provider AWS in just one place in your Crossplane control plane. And then everyone should get access to that new feature and everyone who doesn't want to use that new feature, everything should just have same defaults for them. That's how we sort of design our upgrade story. The one exception to this is our alpha APIs. We do have our, uh, APIs that are uh, rated V1 alpha, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, those kind of all bets are off because we're still experimenting with the features there. So we're thinking we might actually put those behind a feature flag or something soon so that, you know, just really shows people these are the ones that we don't provide that contract for. They're there if you want to try them but um, beware that if you upgrade, they might break. But for everything else, all of our V1 beta one and our core V1 APIs, it's a, it's a really safe upgrade path. Okay. Um, one, uh, another, excuse me, another access control, um, another limitation is access control. Um, again, going back to uh, our, you know, at the beginning when I said that we, our infrastructure is three different modules, lots of resources, a lot, uh, lots of sub-modules. Um, in those layers, uh, we actually uh, provision IAM roles for the next layer. So for one layer we have, for the account level layer, we have the, we provision the admin IAM roles that will be used in the infrastructure layer where we provision the resources. And then the next level provides the IAM roles for the tenant level and whatever they, whatever that level needs to provision whatever resources they have. So it is essentially IAM role food. <laughs> we rely heavily on AWS to, to configure resources within our cluster. Terraform has 
no concept of access control. So we have to basically rely on the cloud provider to, uh, and cloud provider in combination with, you know, clever naming conventions to get what we want down, you know, our walled garden, um, as one of my colleagues put it, uh, for our developers. So, it's, it's, so yeah, so it kind of uh, just undermines self-service and it's not, uh, we were, a lot of people, so our admins have to be aware of a lot of different things. So if a user wants to do something, they have to go back and refer to us to, or to ask us for access instead of having it more of a more uh, natural configuration. So there's a lot of, um, I guess, tribal knowledge amongst the admins, a bunch of, a, bunch of, a few teams to um, get this going. So it's a, so instead of working on new features to expand the platform, we're having to, to, to worry about a lot um, of special configuration to accomplish um, access control. So I think the, the fundamental nice thing about access control in cross-plane, uh, there's some technical details that we sort of touch on, but, but sort of from a, fundamentally, the nice thing is that in cross-plane access, access control is framed around your business's concepts, not necessarily your cloud providers, not AWS's concepts. So I, I think I touched on briefly before that you can deliver these configurations to cross-plane. Uh, and what these configurations include uh, are what we call compositions and composite resources, which are effectively your own custom APIs. Uh, so in Guidewise case, instead of saying, um, a team has access to AWS concepts like S3 buckets and maybe I think S3 bucket website policies or all the various things you can do with a bucket at that, that API level. Um, you can just come up with an opinionated guide wire abstraction that might be like, you know, a, a guide wire storage or a guide wire bucket or a guide wire database. It's actually made up of like multiple different things in the, in the back end, multiple different AWS things. And because this is all done in the Kubernetes API, you can use Kubernetes RBAC to restrict this. So Crossplane actually has uses credentials to talk to AWS, obviously, you need to give it credentials somehow, and it can load those from Kube to IAM, or it can load them from IRSA, uh, it can, you can just give it a config file with, uh, sorry, a secret, I should say, rather, with uh, your, um, your AWS account keys, and you can even have multiple of those providers, so you can say some of these resources, you know, this team are going to go use this account, this team's going to use that account, et cetera, et cetera, but it's kind of layered, you grant cross plan access to act on your behalf on AWS or any cloud, any, any API that you call it. And then you use RVAC to restrict what people can ask Crossplane to do uh, on their behalf. So it allows you to frame uh, access control along the lines of sort of, uh, can this person create a guide wire bucket in this namespace? and doesn't rely on managing a ton of uh, hyper granular AWS access controls behind the scenes. Sort of thing. if you trust Crossplane you can limit the rights the crossplane has. If you only ever want to use do buckets, you can just give crossplane access to only do buckets. So you, you can be as restrictive as you want, but you sort of, it, it shifts the access control up a layer into the Kubernetes API where you're modeling your business's needs, not AWS's API. Okay. Um, again, gonna keep recapping our uh, structure. So uh, basically, uh, our our infrastructure, the layers are very well. One, the bottom layer is the okay. So the top layer depends on the next one, and then there's the next one depends on the bottom layer. So a tenant relies on the infrastructure, which relies on the account level. So there's no way within Terraform itself for one for the tenant level to access what we've already provisioned for the infrastructure. So um, they're just configured in isolation. So even though the infrastructure level is necessary for the tenant to sit on top of, um, there's no way to actually access these resources or kind of write configuration where we can dynamically, uh, I guess, use it to refer to that lower level. So we have to, uh, either rely on, you know, already knowledge that somebody knows to name this certain resource this way, like our, like, for example, our 
back in state file or state bucket that stores our Terraform state file for the tenant has been provisioned by the infrastructure level. So we already we follow a naming convention and we just hard code the whole name. It'd be nice if there was a way that somehow the layer could just discover it and we don't have to worry about it in the configuration. But um, right now we have to do that. Uh, so there is ways that um, Terraform allows you to discover resources that exist. Like we do um, have, we do have to basically check to see if the cluster is there, but it's, again, it's a, something that's hitting Kubernetes directly or um, there's uh, you, you, the Terraform does give you the ability to run a script that you know make an API call, but again, you're it's still directly hitting AWS. But you know we provisioned our resources via Terraform. Why, there should be a way to kind of query within that within the tool to get this get these resources. Yeah, so I think the advantage that the Crossplane has here is, is sort of the interoperability that comes from being a control plane with a REST API. So, you know, in Terraform, you could theoretically, uh, you know, you, you can run Terraform and maybe write some output sort of thing, but you end up having to sort of wrap Terraform in a script sort of thing or, or start using complex shared state relationships and things like that to, to, to refer to other modules if that's, if that's even possible in your use case. Um, whereas with Crossplane, um, everything is just an object in a REST API. So at the crossplane layer itself, we have uh, we have sort of ways of referring uh, to things. Um, so when you're composing infrastructure together, sort of thing, you can you can basically uh, refer to. Uh, you can have the infrastructure that you compose can potentially like reference other bits of infrastructure and say, hey, you should go be in this VPC. I just tell you to go point to that VPC that's also modeled with crossplane, and it'll it'll kind of figure it out. We build that at the uh, at the managed resource layer. Um, we also support basically many, uh, maybe maybe most of our crossplane resources um, are able to write some or all of their interesting connection details to a secret to make it extra easy to compose uh, to, to consume. I mean, again, everything's just a REST API, so if you can write like a Python client of a REST API, so you can pull out whatever you need to get from from crossplane. But uh, if you're a pod or something like that, and you want to make it like really easy to get like the connection details for a database, um, either because you want to consume it from an application or because you want to like build other infrastructure on top of it, um, then you could say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna write this data to a secret, and then something else, you know, pods can have built-in machinery to load up environment variables, config files, or that kind of thing from from secrets. Uh, one limitation that we uh, that we need to uh, figure out in Crossplane at the moment that's on our sort of backlog is. Um, Crossplane uh, does not yet have anything like a Terraform data source. So Crossplane is really good at giving you information about stuff that Crossplane manages, but it's uh, as yet doesn't have great functionality for giving you information about um, arbitrary other stuff. Let's say, you know, there's a, there's a database running over there or a cluster running over there or a VPC running over there that Crossplane is not in charge of. It's not the source of truth for its state. Um, it's, it doesn't currently have any functionality to go and grab details about that uh, thing. Um, but there is a bit of an escape hatch here, at least, which again is just that um, we we exist within the Kubernetes API. So um, while it's not the easiest thing in the world to write a Kubernetes controller, it is possible to write your own code um, to interact with our APIs and glue this together at the moment, sort of thing. So it's possible today with a bit of elbow grease and, and, and code, uh, and we aim to make it just a native part of the cross-plane ecosystem soon. And one last limitation. I know earlier I said that HCL has allowed us to scale very quickly and, um, well, when they scale very quickly, to allow us to get our platform implemented in a very, you know, in a relatively short amount of time. But we're, we're, we're getting to, we're, we're starting to uh, get a little bit more sophisticated with how we manage and we need, and it's, uh, it's, we're starting to understand that we need to work closer with the cluster. So it's just turning into another thing to maintain. Again, our file is in Git, our state is in S3. And then we also currently right now work, you know, we run our kubectl commands. So 
would it, it be nice if we could just, you know, kind of work a little bit more closer with the cluster, have our um, Kubernetes resources and be closer to Kubernetes. So, um, yeah, so we can be more productive. So we don't have to worry about, again, you know, where things are in, in, in a somewhere else that is not in a, you know, just logging in a terminal and just messing around at that, at that part, you know, just using just one, one interface. <laughs> So I think the the advantage that Crossplane has here is pretty much what Delorean just touched on. Um, uh, it's tool and consistency, effectively. I think if you if you're a hypothetical organization that does not either use Terraform or Kubernetes, and you're thinking, "Hey, I'd like to go manage my cloud infrastructure declaratively," it's probably about the same level of maintenance and burden and learning to go use either Crossplane or Terraform. But increasingly, we're seeing that a lot of people are just using Kubernetes already. You know, they've already bought into Kubernetes for maybe managing their apps. Um, you know, so that developers are getting used to writing deployments for containerized apps or using something like Argo CD or just, you know, operating down the kubectl uh, layer. So if they are doing that, and they've, you know, the people have already invested, invested in learning and maintaining Kubernetes, it's a smaller shift to sort of add cross play as a Kubernetes add-on uh, that, that uses similar patterns, uh, basically run that, offer that uh, as a platform team to your users, than it is to learn a different DSL uh, for, for Terraform sort of thing and uh, keep all the tooling and plumbing running to get Terraform going in your CI CD system or all that kind of thing. And you know, even further than just uh, necessarily saying that if you know Kubernetes, Crossplane is is easy to pick up. Um, we can sort of lean on the fact that again, uh, and it's hard. Kubernetes is sort of like a really good REST API. So uh, even if you have developers who aren't super familiar with with Kubernetes, you could always position it as, hey, you can make these REST API calls to manage your infrastructure. You know, if you're a Python developer or a Java developer or something like that, you can say, hey, there's a really well documented REST API for managing infrastructure, even if you don't want to go learn the intricacies of Kubernetes. So I think just, um, again, the wonders of APIs goes a long way here and just tooling consistency, the fact that everyone's kind of using Kubernetes, not everyone, but many people, a lot of people at this conference are using Kubernetes already. Okay, so right now um, we are taking our first steps to uh, integrating Crossplane into our ecosystem, or I guess migrating on to Crossplane. So right now we're working with my team in particular. We're working with um, managing S3 via Crossplane, and another one of our teams is working with ECR, or working with composing both of these resources in Crossplane. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so anyways, uh, we, we are hitting the, um, we are experiencing the freshness of, you know, this bleeding edge technology, but the cross plane community has been very responsive and very helpful because again, you know, I'm tech, I'm very new to, uh, you know, to Kubernetes and to all this stuff myself, but, um, so maybe sometimes our questions are going to be a little bit obvious to folks that are a little bit more seasoned in the technology. But you know, again, everybody's been nice and helpful, and uh, and maybe one day once you know our you know our team gets a little bit more familiar with Go and everything else, we can contribute back to the community. Yeah, I'll say that uh, speaking as uh, uh, sort of a crossplane steering committee uh, person and maintainer. Uh, one thing I really like about um, working with the folks at Guidewire uh, as part of the Crossplane community is that they really get the vision of the project and I think see a lot of the same value that we see in the project. Um, you know, some people come to Crossplane and they really, they really just want um, what we think of as like the core drivers. They just, they just want to have raw APIs modeled in Kubernetes. And there's value in and of itself there that, that you know, it's valuable by itself, but um, Crossplane really sweats the separation of concern. We really think of Crossplane as a, a tool to build your own APIs as a platform team that you can offer to your uh, to your internal customers, to the developers you support. Um, and Guidewire from the get-go just sort of saw that and has been looking at it that way. Um, and it's really, really nice. You know, we, you know, not the only uh, folks in the in the Crossplane community uh, to, to see that value by, by a long shot, but definitely, um, 
I've been very impressed seeing like guide wise internal presentations and things like that that really like get what we're uh, what we're doing. So it's been a, a lovely to work with folks at Guidewise. Okay, and uh, shout out to Jillian Hill and James Dobson for helping us put together this presentation. And thank you for watching. Thanks, folks.